Now, we've come to a very complicated section of the Word of God, but it's all the result of sin, and sin is always complicated, by the way. Sin is complicated. Goodness is that which is simple, always that way. If I said to you right now, I'm holding in my hand a stick that is absolutely straight, and I ask you to draw a picture of it, all of you draw the same thing. But suppose that I would say I hold in my hand a crooked stick and draw it as you think it is, and there'd not be any two would be alike. A thing can be straight in only one way. It can be crooked in a million different ways, even more than that. And that is the allurement of sin for a great many today because of the fact that it has that devious way. It seems to be exotic. It seems to be something that is unusual and strange. And it has an enticement because of the fact that it is complicated. Now, chapter 21, verse 1, Now Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers. He was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Jehoram, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, what kind of a man is Jehoram going to be with such a wonderful father? Well, notice what he did. And he had brethren, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Quite a list of them there. And their father gave them great gifts of silver and gold, precious things, with fenced cities in Judah. But the kingdom gave he to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Now when Jehoram was risen up to the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and slew all his brethren with the sword, and I was also the princess of Israel." In other words, he eliminated all competition by the most dastardly means that is imaginable, by slaying these. Actually, why did he do this? He walked in the way of the kings of Israel, like as did the house of Ahab, for he had the daughter of Ahab to wife, and he wrought that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. God doesn't bless mixed marriages, friends. Howbeit, the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he'd made with David, as he promised to give a light to him and his sons forever. This is the place where God ordinarily would have exterminated this line. But you see, God always makes his promises good. Now we are going to see that here. We saw that Jehoram came to the throne after his father's death. And Jehoram just happened to be the one that had married into the family of Ahab. And he learned to do evil from them. And I think he was a very apt pupil, by the way. And he was so evil that God would actually have destroyed the line of David at this juncture. But God had made a promise. Now we find that immediately judgment begins to come upon him. Verse 8, in his days the Edomites revolted from under the dominion of Judah, made themselves a king. Then Jehoram went forth with his princes and his chariots with him, and he rose up by night and smote the Edomites, which compassed him in, and the captains of the chariots. So the Edomites revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. The same time also did Libna, revolt from under his hand, because he had forsaken the Lord God of his fathers. Now, God's Word makes it very clear why this judgment came upon him, and that this was judgment from the hand of God. He can't have peace because of the fact he's forsaken the Lord God of his fathers. Now, it's spelled out for us here. You can't miss that. I, today, get a little impatient with these people who say the Bible does not teach something. What they really mean is they don't believe the Bible. Now, if they say that, I won't find fault with them. That's their business. But when they try to tell me that the Bible doesn't teach certain things when it's as clear as it possibly can be, they make the statement, God would never do such a thing like this. He doesn't judge like that. Well, he says he does, and I'm of the opinion he does. 
And a great many could testify to that. Now we are told here in verse 11, Moreover, he made, that is, Jehorah made the high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit fornication and compel Judah thereto. He actually pushed the people back into idolatry, and Jehoshaphat, his father, had delivered them from it. Now God calls in an old friend. Probably you'd forgotten about him to take a hard message. And this is the man that God always called in for the deliverance of a difficult message. He's a troubleshooter, and he's the right man for the job. And that's Elijah. Now, somebody says, I thought he was translated. The record is back in Kings, but you see Chronicles is going over the same ground. Now, will you notice this? Verse 12, there came a writing to him from Elijah the prophet. Now, there are many people that speak of Elijah as being the prophet who did not write, that he was one of the non-writing prophets. Now, of course, what they mean by that, there's no book in the Bible named for him, that he wrote. Well, he didn't write a book, but he wrote a message. And when he wrote one, it was a message. It singed the paper. In fact, it burned the paper. And here it is. Will you notice this? There came a writing to him from Elijah. The only man that could deliver a message like this would be Elijah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of David thy father, because thou hast not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat thy father, nor in the ways of Asa, king of Judah, but has walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and has made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to go a whoring like to the whoredoms of the house of Ahab, and also has slain thy brethren of thy father's house, which were better than thyself. Behold, with a great plague will the Lord smite thy people and thy children and thy wives, and all thy goods, and thou shalt have great sickness by disease of thy bowels, until thy bowels fall out by reason of the sickness day by day. Now, that's a harsh message, but it's a message that God wanted delivered to this man Jehoram. Now, the contents of the message actually are not unusual. Rather, this is exactly what you'd expect Elijah to deliver. The circumstances are extraordinary. And there are several questions. There are three questions here. Who, when, where? And the first is who. The prophecy is to Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat. Elijah was translated in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat. He wasn't there during the reign of Jehoram. And the assumption is that he could not write this prophecy. And then there are others that say, well, it wasn't Elijah the Tishbite. It was another Elijah, a fellow by the same name. And that always reminds me of what Mark Twain said about Shakespeare. You know, there was always been an argument of whether Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare or not. Some think Francis Bacon wrote it, and others pick out others, that Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare. And Mark Twain's answer, I think, is rather conclusive. He said, Shakespeare did not write Shakespeare. It was written by another man by the same name. And that's what they're trying to say here. They declare that Elijah must have been the author, but it was another Elijah. Well, my friend, may I say this is Elijah the prophet, and there's no impossible barrier unless you want to reject the supernatural. And if you do, then you won't only reject this, you'd reject the Bible. Elijah the prophet is the one who sent this, Elijah that was translated. Now, when did he write it? Did he write it after his translation? Did he write it from the other side? Well, Grotius says the postmark of it was paradise. Well, it wasn't on the letter. And they come up with that interpretation. Well, you can dismiss this as purely speculative. There's a very simple explanation. He wrote it before his translation. And somebody says, well, that's supernatural. That's the point I'm trying to make, friends. It's supernatural. That's the quality of prophecy. And that's the method of all the prophets. The very interesting thing is, Isaiah spoke of Cyrus of Persia two centuries before he was even born. And Daniel wrote of Alexander the Great. 
and Micah picked out Bethlehem as being the place where the Messiah would be born. That's prophecy. Only God can do that. Now, what we have here was when Jehoram came to the throne, he found a message on the front steps of the palace. It was thrown there by God's paper boy. Elijah had left it. This is the only reference, by the way, to Elijah and Chronicles. And remember, Chronicles is giving God's viewpoint. Didn't God take delight in Elijah? And of course he did. Well, then why isn't he mentioned more here? Well, it's not that God omitted Elijah. He omitted the northern kingdom. And Elijah was the prophet to the northern kingdom. His ministry was there. And this is the only time that he spoke to a king in the south, that is, to Judah, and he never spoke to Jehoshaphat for the very simple reason. Jehoshaphat was a good king, and Elijah only delivered the stiff, hard messages. But when Jehoram came to the throne, his son, well, there was a message there waiting for him, and Elijah had written it before he left. Now, we have here, therefore, something that's interesting. It indicates to me that Elijah's message is not finished. And it means that when he left his mantle with Elisha, he left a message also to give to Jehoram. And he says, you'll be seeing him, I won't. And it's a message of judgment. And it also makes me believe that this man Elijah is one of the two witnesses in Revelation that's going to deliver a harsh message again in a day when men have turned from God. I think that makes this a very remarkable passage of Scripture, and this unusual message is delivered at this time. Now what happens to Jehoram? Verse 16, Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines and of the Arabians that were near the Ethiopians. Now all of these had been at peace with both Asa and Jehoshaphat. But now their spirit is stirred up. War is coming. Why war is the result of sin? We sometimes think that war is made way out yonder on the battlefield. War takes place at home, friends. That's where it begins. Now notice, verse 17, they came up into Judah and break into it and carried away all the substance that was found in the king's house. And his sons also, his wives so that there was never a son left him, save Jehoahaz, the youngest of his sons. Now, what happens to Jehoram? And after all this, the Lord smote him in his bowels with an incurable disease. Came to pass that in process of time, after the end of two years, his bowels fell out by reason of his sickness, so he died of sore diseases, and his people made no burning for him like the burning of his father's. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years and departed without being desired. It was good riddance of bad rubbish when he died. They buried him in the city of David, but not in the sepulcher of the king. This was probably the most hated man that reigned at that time. Now we're going to find out that his wife was the most hated woman that ever reigned. In chapter 22, And the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his stead, for the band of men that came with the Arabians to the camp had slain all the elders. This was the only boy that was left. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Forty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. He reigned one year in Jerusalem. Now notice... His mother's name also was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri. That is actually the granddaughter of Omri, but the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. Now, she is actually the queen on the throne. She never gave up that job. Wherefore, he did evil in the sight of the Lord like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. Now, notice what happens here. And this is actually of justice with a vengeance that's wrought upon him. For something very strange happened. 
After all, he's aligned with the northern kingdom and with the house of Ahab because he happens to be a son of that, having listened to his mother. Now, notice what we read here. He walked after his counsel, went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, to war against Haziel, king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead, and the Syrians smote Joram. Now, Jehoram, you'll notice here, it looks like that we have the same man back again. But you see, in this family, that Jehoram was the name that was taken in both the northern and southern kingdoms. Now, this is Jehoram that was king here in the southern kingdom. And what happened? Ahaziah went with him. And notice verse 6, And he returned to be healed in Jezreel because of the wounds which were given him at Ramah when he fought with Hazel, king of Syria. And Azariah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Jehoram, the son of Ahab, at Jezreel because he was sick went down to pay a sick visit to him, probably take him a basket of fruit or something. And the destruction of Ahaziah was of God by coming to Jehoram. For when he was come, he went out with Jehoram against Jehu, the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. And the interesting thing is, Jehu didn't know that this king from the south was up there. So what happened? It came to pass that when Jehu was executing judgment upon the house of Ahab, found the princes of Judah and the sons of the brethren of Ahaziah that ministered to Ahaziah, he slew them. So here is this one cut off. And he sought Ahaziah, and they caught him, for he was hid in Samaria and brought him to Jehu. And when they had slain him, they buried him, because, said they, he is the son of Jehoshaphat who sought the Lord with all his heart, so the house of Ahaziah had no power to keep still the kingdom. Now what happens? And this is a bloody period. Why does God record it? To let you know he judges sin. To let you know that man doesn't get by with it. And how complicated this was. Now, Athaliah, his mother, is the only one left. That is, of that immediate family. Now notice what happened. Verse 10, But when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, what'd she do? Well, she had grandchildren. She arose and destroyed all the seed royal of the house of Judah. And I'll be very frank with you. It takes a bloody person, takes a mean one, to kill grandchildren. I want to say, and many of you listening to me are grandparents, and you know you're feeling towards your grandchild. Well, I know why they call them grandchildren, because they're grand. And the fact of the matter is, I think grandchildren are more wonderful than children. If I'd have known how wonderful they were, I'd have had my grandchildren before I had my children, because they really are wonderful. And how this bloody queen could slay her grandchildren, I don't understand, but that's what she did. But she slew all but one. We are told here that... Hoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons that were slain and put him and his nurse in a bedchamber. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah, so that she slew him not. And he was with them, hid in the house of God six years, and Athaliah reigned over the land. Now, if this hadn't taken place, the entire line of David would have been cut off. And God's promise to David, the coming of the Messiah, would never have taken place. Now, this is how close it was. You see, Satan has made attempt again and again to destroy the line that was leading to Christ. He did it, you will recall, down in the land of Egypt, the slaying of the firstborn, in the time of Haman later on. And then when Jesus was born, old Herod tried to slay him. Now what you have here is another instance when the line of David is reduced to just one individual. Now notice what happens 
This little fella comes to the throne now because they keep him for six years. He was one year old when it happened. And we read in verse 1 of chapter 23, And in the seventh year Jehoiada strengthened himself, and he took the captains of hundreds, Azariah the son of Jerohim, and all of this crowd here, all of the leadership of Israel, or of Judah, were dissatisfied with this bloody queen. And so now Jehoiada calls them to a meeting, a very private meeting, and lets them know that there was a son of David that still is alive. And so they are going to make him king because they were all pledged to do that. Verse 11, Then they brought out the king's son, put upon him the crown, and gave him the testimony, and made him king. And Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, God save the king. This is this little fellow, seven years old, in the line of David. And he comes now to the throne. Now, Athaliah, she killed off all the offspring. Why? She wanted to be queen. Uh, thirst for power. There are certain men, certain women in this world that will do anything for power. There are preachers that will do that. There are deacons that will do that. And there are Christians that will do that. Do anything in order to have power. They won't find There are politicians that will do that. And there are dictators that will do that. And that was this woman here. Now, notice verse 12. When Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she came to the people into the house of the Lord. She looked, and behold, the king stood at his pillar at the entering in. And I tell you, this woman, Athaliah, she's taken by surprise. Then Athaliah ran her clothes and said, Treason, treason. Then Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains of hundreds that was set over the host, said unto them, Have her forth of the ranges, and whoso followeth her, let him be slain with the sword. For the priest said, Slay her not in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her. When she'd come to the entering of the horse gate by the king's house, they slew her there. And Jehoiada made a covenant between him and between all the people and between the king that they should be the Lord's people. Now, actually, Jehoiada leads in a revival. He's God's priest at that time. He led in a revival. It was during the reign now, this little fellow, Joash, because he is the one that's on the throne. He's in the line of David. And Jehoiada will be his regent. He'll actually be the one to make the decisions till this boy comes of age. But you'll find out he was a good king. Now, we find here that this is the beginning of a revival. And we're told here, verse 21, And all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet after they had slain Athaliah with the sword. Sin always brings complications, brings trouble, it brings heartbreak, and it brings the judgment of God. Athaliah, the line of Ahab and Jezebel, finally eliminated. Now, and has brought to the throne now this little fellow, and I read in verse 1 of chapter 24, Joash was seven years old when he began to reign. He reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zabiah of Beersheba. He had a good mother, you see. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. And Jehoiada took for him two wives, begat sons and daughters. Now, Jehoiada is the one that had helped protect this little fella when he was born, and Athaliah killed all the sons in the Davidic line, and he was left. And he's the one that brought this little fella out when he was seven years old in order to get rid of the bloody Athaliah. Now he comes to the throne, and we're told here that Jehoiada is the one that guided him and led him all this time. He had a good mother because her name is given here. She's from Beersheba. It was Abraham's town also. And he had a good mother, and he had the coaching of Jehoiada. Then you have this strange statement, verse 3, "...and Jehoiada took for him two wives." 
and he begat sons and daughters. Now, this didn't happen when he was seven years old. You must remember, he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. He was 47 years old when he died. So this young man now, being coached by Jehoiada, and he takes him two wives. And, of course, I know the critic is going to come along and say, yes, and that was wrong. Yes, it was wrong. God didn't approve it. It's not recorded because God approves it. It's recorded because that's what he did. And the only thing that you can say for this is that it's the less of two evils. Frankly, most of the kings had quite an array of wives, and two was really a small number. Then you have the complexion, the background of that day. And on the background of that day, this was extremely mild, and especially for a king. In that day. Now we're told that as he grew up and Jehoiada grew old, we'll find that he died when he was 130 years old. So he apparently became very senile before he died. And the other priests that came along, they proved to be evil in their actions. I'm reading verse 4. It came to pass after this that Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. Now, we have listed Joash as being one that led in revival. Well, that may be questioned. I'm sure that there are some that would question that. They would say, well, you didn't have much of a revival under Joash. And that's probably true, but we have to call it revival because that's exactly what it was. Notice what he did. Verse 5, he gathered together the priests and the Levites, and he said to them, Go out unto the cities of Judah and gather of all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year, and see that ye hasten the matter. Howbeit the Levites hastened it not. And the king called for Jehoiada the chief and said unto him, Why hast thou not required of the Levites to bring in out of Judah and out of Jerusalem? the collection according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the congregation of Israel for the tabernacle of witness. For the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken up the house of God, and also the dedicated things of the house of the Lord did they bestow upon Balaam. Now, what Joash wants to do is to repair it. And Jehoiada apparently has grown old by this time, And the priests, they just fell down on the job and didn't do it. Verse 8, And at the king's commandment, they made a chest and set it without at the gate of the house of the Lord. They made a proclamation through Judah and Jerusalem to bring into the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. And all the princes, all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until they had made an end. That is, they got all they needed. Now it came to pass that at what time the chest was brought into the king's office by the hand of the Levites, when they saw that there was much money, the king's scribe and the high priest's officer came and emptied the chest and took it and carried it to his place again. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. Now this was his method, using the chest of Joash. And by the way, many organizations since then have used that method. They put out what they call a chest of Joash and have people give. That's the way that it is taken up. Instead of sending the Levites out, well, Joash couldn't trust them. And now he puts this chest there in the temple and people come and give. And as a result, the repair work of the temple was carried on. Verse 12, and the king and Jehoiada gave it to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord, hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord, and also such as wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. Apparently, the temple was in a terribly disreputable condition. And now Joash repairs it. So the workmen wrought, the work was perfected by them, and they set the house of God in his state and strengthened. When they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money 
for the king and Jehoiada where I were made vessels for the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister and to offer withal spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. Now, Jehoiada was the high priest and apparently had become very old, because read now verse 15. But Jehoiada waxed old. He was full of days when he died. A hundred and thirty years old was he when he died. Now, that would give the explanation of why the priests were negligent in carrying out the order of the king. Jehoiada was actually senile, and he'd had the experience of bringing up this boy. I suppose that He had liberties that no one else would have with the king. Verse 16, And they buried him in the city of David among the kings, because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house. This man received actually royal honors in his death. Now we read, After the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. And wrath came from Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. You see, as long as Jehoiada lived, the princess did not dare go into idolatry. Jehoiada had a firm hand. Joash, a young king, probably very lenient. And then these princes, they pledge allegiance to him, but they go out also and worship we find that then God begins to judge. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord. They testified against them, but they would not give ear. So what happened? And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, which stood above his people and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord? that ye cannot prosper, because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him, and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Now, apparently, Joash had been given wrong information about the prophet of God, and he was the son of Jehoiada. You would think Joash would never have done a thing like this, but it reveals the influence of the princes and their despicable deeds that they were doing, and they put him to death. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada's father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it and require it. And in other words, Zechariah the son called upon God to take vengeance upon the king for this. And notice now what takes place. came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria came up against him, and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people and sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus. For the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, and the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. Now, you see, God judged him for doing this. Though he'd been a good king, yet he committed this act, and God judged him because he was king and because of its influence upon the nation. Now, verse 25, "...when they were departed from him, for they left him in great diseases, his own servants conspired against him, for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest, and slew him on his bed, and he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they buried him not in the sepulcher of the kings. His father had been buried with honor. Now the king buried with dishonor. These are they that conspired against him, and their names are given here. Now we are told now concerning his sons and the greatness of the burdens laid upon him and the repairing of the house of God Behold, they are written in the story of the book of the kings. And Amaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. So you have Joash leading at the beginning a revival under the influence of Jehoiada. But when he died, apparently 
this man lapsed back into a state of apostasy. Now we have in chapter 25, Amaziah was 25 years old. When he began to reign, he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoiadam of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. He was a pretty good king, you see. Now it came to pass, when the kingdom was established to him, that he slew his servants, that he killed the king his father. He took vengeance upon them. But he slew not their children, but did as it is written in the law in the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, The fathers shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for the fathers, but every man shall die for his own sin. That's a very important statement. You may have a very godly mother, but you'll never go to heaven because of a godly mother. You go to heaven because of the faith that you will exercise yourself in Christ. It has to be personal. And you'll never be judged because of the sins of your mother, the sins of your father. You stand judged on the basis of your own. This is a tremendous principle that's put out in here. Now we find that Amaziah gathered Judah together and made them captains over thousand. He's getting ready for war. And he also hires an army. And there came a man of God to him. Now I'm dropping down to verse 7. O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel to wit with all the children of Ephraim. But if thou wilt go do it, be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy, for God hath power to help the cast down. Now he warns Amaziah, trust God. And he has the example that's been given to him by Jehoshaphat in the past and Asa. And yet notice what happens. If thou will go do it, trust God, you see. And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? The man of God answered, The Lord's able to give thee much more than this. Then Amaziah separated them to wit the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again. Wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. And Amaziah strengthened himself, led forth his people, went to the valley of salt, that would be down at the Dead Sea, and smote the children of Seir 10,000, and so on. I'm dropping down to verse 14. It came to pass after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the children of Seir, set them up to be his god. This is amazing that this man would do a thing like this but it reveals the iniquity that's in the human heart. Verse 15, Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah, and he sent unto him a prophet, which said to him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? Came to pass as he talked with him that the king said unto him, Art thou made of the king's counsel? Forbear, why shouldst thou be smitten? Then the prophet forbear and said, I know that God hath determined to destroy thee, because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. Now we find that civil war breaks out again. Then Amaziah king of Judah took advice and sent to Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us see one another in the face, and let's see eyeball to eyeball. And Joash king of Israel sent to Amaziah king of Judah, saying, The thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, Give thy daughter to my son to wife, and there passed by wild beast that was in Lebanon trod down the thistle. Well, he sends to him a nice little parable, as it were, and says to him, I don't think we'll be able to meet together. Thou sayest, Lo, thou hast smitten Edomites, and thine heart lifted up, to boast, abide now at home. Why shouldst thou meddle to thine hurt, that thou shouldst fall, even thou and Judah with thee? But Amaziah would not hear, for it came of God that he might deliver them into the hand of their enemies, because they sought after the gods of Edom. Now God judges him. And we're told here, And Joash the king of Israel took Amaziah king of Judah, 
the son of Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, at Beth Shemesh, and brought him to Jerusalem, break down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate, 400 cubits. He took all the gold and silver. And Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived after the death of Joash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, 15 years. Now the rest of the acts of Amaziah, first and last, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Now after the time that Amaziah did turn away from following the Lord, they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem. He fled to Lachish. But they sent the Lachish after him and slew him there. And they brought him upon horses, buried him with his fathers in the city of Judah. Now, we have here a very ordinary record, you see, rather monotonous, don't you think? Now we come to Uzziah. All the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. And he built Eloth and restored it to Judah. And after that, the king slept with his father. Sixteen years old was Uzziah when he began to reign. He reigned fifty and two years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah did. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Now, Uzziah was a good king, but not outstanding. No revival during his time. And it was during this period, by the way, that Isaiah began his ministry. He was commissioned at the death of Uzziah, by the way, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up. That was Isaiah's statement in the sixth chapter. Now we find that God blessed Uzziah in war, and he did many works here. And then we're going to look at something that is quite interesting. We have very little of the record of Uzziah here, because there's nothing in his reign that God noted particular except one thing, and that was his funeral. And you're going to see what is called a happy funeral. Now, I think that today, that especially among Christians, that we need to recognize that death for a child of God is not tragic. It can never be. And you can always say at the death of a Christian, oh, death Where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Paul said to the Thessalonians, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, that your sorrow not is others which have no hope. Why? Because those that have died, they go and be with Christ, which is far better. And therefore, funerals are not always as sad as they seem. I learned that very early in my ministry, that that is true. And I want us to look at the funeral of this man, because I think that it has a message for us. Uzziah had a long reign, but nothing spectacular. And actually, his funeral was really a happy funeral. It was one that you could actually rejoice in. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. We're told in verse 4, according to all that his father Amaziah did. However, very candidly, I was not very much impressed by his father Amaziah, but Uzziah was a good king. And that was unusual for the kingdoms. In fact, in the northern kingdom, there was never a good king, not a one. And in the southern kingdom, there were very few. There were about five of them that could be considered exceptional because during their reign, there came in the great revival and reformation. Now, Uzziah's reign didn't produce revival, but he was a good king. He was not a bad king. I think I told you before that in the college I went to, which was quite liberal, They had a Bible course. It was very fragmentary, but 
one of the questions that apparently had been asked from time immemorial from the very founding of the school was to name the kings of Israel and Judah and briefly describe the reign of each. Some ingenious freshman in days gone by have discovered that if you write after each one of them a bad king, you can't make less than 95%. And who in the world that is any freshman would want to make more than 95%? So the thing that we did, we just memorized the kings and we wrote after them, bad king, bad king. Now, you'd be wrong when you wrote that after Isaiah, because Isaiah was a good king. He did several things here that are quite interesting, and I want to call your attention to them. In verse 6, we're told, He went forth and warred against the Philistines. He broke down the wall of Gath. And you remember, that was one of the strongholds of the Philistines. And the wall of Jabna, and the wall of Ashdod and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. I was in Ashdod some time ago, and it's experiencing a tremendous business boom today. You see, they've made a harbor there. There's actually only one harbor along that coast, and that was up the way, but none here. And in the old days, the ancient ships could come in at Caesarea, but they couldn't come in here. But now there's a wonderful harbor there. It's a man-made harbor, and it's receiving, I suppose, more of the goods that are being shipped in and out than any other place in Israel. And it's the place where the oil pipeline comes from over the Red Sea, and then it's piped and then put back in tankers and carried from there. And they're just building everywhere there. Well, that entire area is what this man Isaiah took. And not only the Philistines, all that was Philistine country, and the Ammonites gave gifts to Isaiah. That's verse 8. And his name spread abroad even to the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and in the valley gate and the turning of the wall and fortified them. Also, he built towers in the desert and he digged many wells, for he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains, husbandmen also and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. Now, this man was quite a remarkable ruler. He was a man that was at heart a farmer and also a rancher. And down in that area from Ashdod and Ashkelon and Gath all the way down to Beersheba, is great pasture lands uh, is today, great place for raising cattle and sheep, and that's what he did. And then on up toward Carmel, you'll get in the valley of Esdraelon, And that's a great fruit country, especially grapes. And he went into that. And we're told he loved husbandry. He loved this type of thing. In verse 11, moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men that went out to war by bands according to the number of their count by the hand of Jeel, the scribe, and Maaseah, the ruler, under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains, the whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600. Now, he was a tremendous general, by the way, a man that was gifted in warfare. And we find, verse 13, under their hand was an army, 300,000, 7,500. And this man was very successful as a general. And we read verse 14, And Isaiah prepared for them throughout all the hosts, shields and spears and helmets and habergians and bows and slings to cast stones. Now, notice, in ancient warfare, they made certain kinds of machines whereby they could hurl rocks. 
and also that they could fix bows and arrows without being pulled by human power. They would be able to build a bow tremendous size and reach a tremendous distance. Now, who started all that? Notice verse 15. He made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Now, this man, Isaiah, was responsible for that. A type of new method of warfare, by the way. Then we notice here he does something. And have you noticed that all of these kings, even the good ones, there was always a chink in their armor. There was the Achilles heel. There's always the weakness. That is man today. I don't care what man he is, there is a weak spot. Now, notice what he did here. Verse 16, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. And sometimes success is the worst thing that can happen to any of us because we're lifted up with pride. Now, notice what he did. I'm still reading in verse 16. For he transgressed against the Lord his God. And he went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now, somebody says, isn't that all right? No, it was all wrong for him. Why? And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto the Uzziah to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests the sons of Aaron that are consecrated to burn incense, go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. In other words, the priests could actually resist the king in this matter because the king is usurping the priest's office and doing what was strictly forbidden except the sons of Aaron. And as far as incense was concerned, only the priests, the sons of Aaron, only they ministered in the holy place, especially at the altar of incense and the golden lampstand. And Aaron himself took care of the golden lampstand, and that became the prerogative of the high priests from that day on. Now, notice what happened to this man. Verse 19, Then Isaiah was wroth and had a censer in his hand, to burn incense, and while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. And Isaiah the king was a leper unto the day of his death, and dwelt in a several house, that is, a separate house, so he wouldn't have contact with others, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord, and Jotham his son was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Isaiah. First and last did Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, write, And by the way, when we get to the prophecy of Isaiah, we're going to find out he goes over this ground. And we find that he began his ministry at the death of Isaiah. Now, let me read that, verse 23. So Isaiah slept with his fathers. They buried him with his fathers in the field of the burial which belongeth to the kings. For they said, He's a leper. And Jotham, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, let's look here for just a moment at this man and his funeral. This is a happy funeral, if you please. There is an expression that's used today, drop dead, you know. Well, that's what happened to this man. And someone was telling me that saw a card that was gotten out 
by someone connected with the International Casket Company. And whoever it was had his name. He was a salesman. And down at the bottom it said, Drop Dead. Well, that, my friend, that is a sick form of humor, I would say. But I can't help but smile at it. Now, for a Christian, death actually should have no dread. You could say, O death, where is thy sting? And you remember Paul could say to the Thessalonians, I would not have you ignorant brethren concerning them that are asleep, that you sorrow not as those that have no hope. Now, as we said last time, funerals are not always sad as they seem. I never indulge in cheap sentiment. And I never major in deathbed stories, as you well know. But because I found out in my ministry that death is not always a tragedy in a home. I had an experience when I was a very young preacher. I had the funeral with the former pastor of the church. He'd been a very wonderful friend, been like a father to me. And he never would take a funeral unless they would ask me to have part. And we were having the funeral one day of a wife. And I noticed the husband showed no emotion whatsoever. And out at the cemetery, why he didn't show any, I had the committal. And I made a few remarks as a young preacher that were rather sentimental, I guess. Then we rode back in the funeral car with this retired preacher and myself with this man now that's lost his wife. And nobody said anything. And I wondered why this former preacher didn't say something, because he knew the man well. And finally, that man just seemed to well up with emotion. And he said, turning to this preacher, and he called him by name, and he said, Dr. So-and-so, I know you'll understand, but I thank God. I buried that woman. And I want to tell you, for a young preacher, that was about the most shocking thing I'd ever heard in my life. I don't know if I've heard anything more shocking since then. And I couldn't say a word. I didn't know what to say. And this former preacher said, I understand, and that is it. I never said any more from then on. And then afterward, the former preacher told me, he said, you know, you don't know what that man has gone through in his life. He said that woman was a terror, and she made his life miserable. And there was no love between them at all. That had ceased long, long ago. And he said that actually the death of that woman was no sorrow to that man whatsoever. So I've learned that sometimes a funeral is a joyful occasion, not always a sad thing. Now, the funeral of Isaiah was not sad. Why? It was a leper. And he'd been a good king, and God had recorded his sin. He intruded into the priest's office. That was the spot on the apple. That was the nature of his sin, presumption. This very day, some people have sinned, actually, and go into church. They presume. There's an attempt made today to approach God by man's way and not by God's way. And God told his people, you come my way. And the Lord Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, he tried to come in his way, and he was made a leper. Now, that was an awful disease. And it was an awful disease physically. It was an awful disease psychologically. It was an awful disease any way you think of it. And entailed a great deal of suffering. And death for him was a sweet release. And he was God's man. In spite of his sin, he was judged down here for that. Remember, Paul said to the believers, said, if we judge ourselves, we'd not be judged. He went to paradise in that day. There are multitudes of believers listening to me today, helpless and hopeless in a frail and feeble body. And One of these days, why, there'll be a sweet release for them. And what a joyful thing it's going to be for them to go into the presence of the king. That'll be a wonderful thing, friends. There's nothing to sorrow about in a case like that. And that was the death of Uzziah the king. And Jotham, 
I think he was dry-eyed at the funeral. I'm sure he loved his father, but he knew what it meant. He knew that he was a saved man. To go and be with Christ is far better 